Thanks. It's so exciting to get to be here and talk about this project. And J-PAL has been instrumental in getting the resources together and connecting researchers with policymakers. I walked into the lobby and I heard Tamara's voice and my head snapped around. We embrace like the long lost friends that we are because we've never met, but we speak on the phone every week for as long back as I can remember. <laughs> And the disembodied voice is an actual human being. Um, but it speaks to how important the collaboration between the implementers and the program deliverers, the funders and the researchers is during the fielding of the data collection and the intervention itself to make the evaluation meaningful and produce the kind of evidence that everybody wants. So. Uh, Tamar spoke eloquently about the history of NFP in being built on randomized controlled evidence, which is uh, way ahead of its time and what gives real strength to the program today. So you might say, didn't we already do that RCT? Don't we get to do other RCTs now? Like, why are you still evaluating this program? And, and there are two important reasons that I think this collaboration is going to be really beneficial. The first is NFP had always been funded through philanthropy. It was never a Medicaid benefit. And the reason it wasn't a Medicaid benefit is that it's very hard to spend public health program dollars on something that is not traditional health care. And yes, these are services being delivered by nurses, but it's not the type of thing Medicaid usually pays for. And there's this growing appreciation for the importance of social determinants in driving health outcomes. We know that if you can get families and kids living in healthier environments and with better information, surely their health is going to be better. But it's a very slippery slope to then say, Medicaid dollars can pay for anything that you think might improve someone's health. First of all, we don't know for sure what actually works until you have the RCT evidence. And it might work very differently in a Medicaid population. And Medicaid can't be a program designed to cure our, all social ills. It has to be focused on health outcomes. So if you can pair a program like Nurse Family Partnership with an accountability metric, like a pay for success contract, you can say, wait a minute, if through this outside the walls of the healthcare initiative, you can improve the health outcomes of low income kids and their families that would be expensive to the state downstream, then we can justify spending state, more state dollars through healthcare programs like Medicaid on these kinds of services. It also then draws in the philanthropic funding that might not have been available if the funds weren't then reinvested based on what was actually succeeding. So it opens up a new funding model, which could be really important for a lot of different programs, and it brings new stakeholders to the table. Now, that's a lot of different stakeholders. There's the, the Medicaid waiver, and so you've got the federal government and the state involved with that. You've got NFP, you've got the home office, but then NFP is delivered through implementing agencies that are smaller scale throughout the state. We're partnering with nine of those. And then you've got the philanthropists, and there are several of those. And then there are the data owners, and those are all different people. And suddenly you have conference calls with 50 people once a week for the rest of your life. And so, so that is you know, both a real opportunity and a challenge for all of us involved and necessitates working together in lockstep throughout a very long implementation process. So we talked a little bit about the pay for success contract. The only thing that I want to highlight here is that there are some short term measures, relatively short term, that are built into the pay for success contract as the success metrics. And then there are a much broader set of outcomes that NFP is interested in, that researchers are interested in, that policymakers ought to be interested in. So for the contract, Success is measured on some pretty narrow but very important measures. Are, first of all, there's one process measure. Are they reaching a sufficient share of people from underserved low income zip codes? Part of the goal was to expand the service into areas that were traditionally underserved and to do it, if possible, at lower cost. So that, that's a program innovation in and of itself. But then three health outcome metrics, reducing preterm birth, Increasing birth spacing, where healthy birth spacing is seen as two years plus between kids, and reducing childhood injuries as measured by emergency department or hospital visits. Now, those metrics were chosen in part because NFP has, there's some evidence that NFP can affect them, but also because they would play out in state Medicaid budgets. If you can reduce emergency department visits for these kids, that money could then be redevoted to the program. Uh, 
those are great goals, but they're surely a small subset of the things that we would like to examine. And so as researchers, we're examining a wide range of outcomes beyond the pay for success contract, and South Carolina is an amazingly data rich state. So that's a really good news. We're able to look at a wide range of outcomes using administrative data. Talking to people in person, as, as Amy said, we're not very qualified at talking to actual human beings, unlike the, the nurses on the front line at NFP. And if you want to wait to see what happens to kids' educational outcomes in the next 18 years after they're born, you're going to have to track them for a long time to try to talk to them yourself. But South Carolina aggregates all this data across so social services, from education to participation in other social programs to criminal justice to earnings, a really wide range of outcomes. So we're going to track those in administrative data, which is feasible, although <laughs> we have our, our, our project manager extraordinaire sitting in the front row who produces every month or so these timelines for us, where I think, I'm doing what in 2025? <laughs> but, but you know, this takes some real dedication of all of the partners to track these things for a very long time, but I think it is possible. Uh, the randomization is at an individual level, so every potential client for NFP who comes through the door is assessed for eligibility and given a baseline questionnaire, and then is read informed con consent and given the opportunity to consent to participate in the study. And if they don't participate in the study, they can't get access to NFP. That is a real challenge. And, and I'm going to talk a little bit about both the fielding challenges and the evaluation challenges. One of the things that was really important to what I think is the success of the launch of the study is a pilot period where we could work out a lot of the kinks in implementing how you implement the randomization with field workers who are expert at delivering NFP services but have never had to randomize people using a tablet before. How do you deal with stakeholders who are not used to referring their clients to NFP and having them have to win a lottery to get to participate in the program? We randomized two-thirds by agreement, two-thirds into treatment, one-third into control, partly to mitigate the challenge of having a randomization hurdle in what was a program where services were delivered to anyone who was eligible before. And despite all those challenges that uh, we were able to address in the pilot period, we now have more than 900 people enrolled. And hitting those enrollment targets is a, is a really important thing for the funding model as well as the research. So that's a, a huge sigh of relief for everyone, I think, and a real accomplishment to have enrolled 900 people thus far. The fielding challenges, <laughs> these, <laughs> Michelle found these pictures, and they're too perfect. They're in every talk I give about this now. One of the challenges is in layering randomization at the very beginning of a relationship nurses are trying to establish with their clients. So it used to be that a, a nurse home visitor called up a client, recruited her to the program, gained her trust through those initial interviews, demonstrated what the program had to offer, and built this relationship that then lasted through the first two years of the child's life. Now, we're collectively asking them to build a rapport, recruit someone in, roll a die and maybe throw them out. And that is a really horrible thing to have to do as somebody who is trained and motivated by delivering services to incredibly needy populations. So how do you support the nurses in that kind of process that can be really unpleasant? You know, as a, as a researcher, I can say intellectually, the existence of this study expanded the number of people served by NFP. New funding streams came online. They were never able to serve all of the eligible people in South Carolina. Because of the extra resources, they're now serving more people than they were before. So the study in no way denied services to anyone. In fact, it increased the number of people getting services. That sounds great, especially in my head. But then when you are a nurse faced with an actual person who's in desperate need of help that you have been trained to give and you can't do it, that's, that's a, an incredibly difficult situation to be in. And the people they didn't serve before were not in front of them. They were abstractions. And now they're in front of them. So we've been working collectively to try to figure out how to deal with that. I, I bring that up not because it's the, the biggest challenge or one that hasn't been overcome, but just to illustrate how layering a study on top of something imposes some logistical challenges. That doesn't cost money, that problem. It's not that money solves it. Money solves a lot of problems. <laughs> I'm an economist. I'm sure we could solve that with a lot of, with enough money. But the, um, 
the challenges have to be appreciated by researchers who may be removed from what's actually going on on the ground. And the only way you can deal with that is in close partnership with the, the implementing partners. And that's why we're all here having coffee and dinner together to try to brainstorm about these. Uh, then thinking about service delivery, it's we need to be sure that the people in the treatment group really get NFP and that's a challenge for the program as new people are getting recruited through new channels because the program is expanding, they need to be sure that the people who are recruited to the study and randomized to the treatment group really do get NFP services and what do those services mean, especially if you're trying to save some money by being more efficient in delivery or targeting delivery. We also need to be sure we know what the control group is getting. It is really important ethically in a study like this that the control group get all of the services to which they would otherwise be entitled and we never want to stand in the way of that. We need to know what those other services are so that we know what we're comparing NFP to. NFP versus business as usual is not no services. It's some bundle of other services and there are other home visiting programs operating in South Carolina. Who's enrolled in them? We need to be sure we know what the control group looks like and that we're not inadvertently boosting above business as usual participation among the control group or suppressing the services that a treatment group member would normally get through NFP because of the intervention. The intervention shouldn't be messing with what is the treatment that we're studying and it shouldn't be messing with what the control group would be getting in the absence of the study. And that is also very challenging. Uh, I feel like the last bullet is perhaps an <coughs> understatement in the current context, but the policy landscape is rapidly evolving and not always certain. And, and that is especially important when you are studying something where we're gonna be enrolling people for four years, the last service is gonna be delivered in six years, now we're gonna be trying to study the outcomes for 18 years after that. I certainly don't expect or hope that policy stays stagnant for that long, but we need to be sure that the buy-in that enabled this program from a lot of different stakeholders doesn't erode as the policy landscape erodes because we're all investing a lot in understanding how NFP affects CERT clients in this new world and if things are changing underneath us before we collect enough data, that's gonna be problematic. So that gets us to evaluation challenges. That was supposed to be fielding challenges, the last one, but you can see how, so, how intertwined they all are. They're, they're challenges from the researcher perspective, nothing like what the nurses face on the front line, but we, we always have to guard against threats to randomization, and those can uh, find their way in really subtly and inadvertently. They're, they're, they're overt threats to randomization where you know, people just want to serve all comers, they don't want to serve the two-thirds who are randomized into treatment. And, and this is, of course, NFP is 100% bought into the randomization, but it's just human nature out in the field, you have to guard against undermining of the randomization function. But then there's subtle ways that it can creep in, and so we're always concerned about that. We're thrilled about the data that's available in South Carolina. I think few states have the kind of integrated administrative data sets that we have access to there, but that does not mean that it's easy. And I can't see if Annetta is in the room or not, but we have, uh, there she is. <laughs> aren't you, why aren't you working on the data use agreements? We, <laughs> Annetta, we have dozens of data use agreements, or we hope to, even though the state agency really amazingly integrates them, you still have to go to each of the owners of the data sets and saying, don't worry, we just wanna follow these people for the rest of their lives. They signed a piece of paper saying it's okay. Uh, there are a lot of hurdles to jump through and there should be. Of course, it's really important that human subjects privacy and informed consent uh, be robust, but it is challenging to get all of the data that we need, and especially in real time, to make sure that we don't discover in 10 years, oh, whoops, that key field is missing. Even though the outcomes may evolve over a long time, you have to get the data flow started right away to make sure that you will have the data you need when it comes time to evaluate the outcomes. Uh, the sample size is, in many ways enormous, there are 6,000 people slated to be taken into the study, 4,000 treatment, 2,000 control, and that's a lot of people for a lot of outcomes. It's not enough people for some of the outcomes that we'd like to study, and that's a challenge, particularly when there is so much money hanging on the point estimates. And really, we are, we, there's an elaborate contract negotiation, as Tamar pointed out, we, the independent evaluators, are not party to the contract, but they were nice enough to ask us if the evaluation language made sense in the contract. And there was a lot of nitty gritty in there because as the evaluators, we do not want to have discretion 
over what the, whether the endpoints are met or not. We want them to be well-defined so that we produce what the data say, treatment versus control, here's exactly how we're gonna do it, and then the data speak for themselves. That is um, you know, challenging when for some of the outcomes, the sample size suggests that there may be a fair amount of variability in the outcomes. We also will be reporting some of the pay for success outcomes along the way as per the contract. As researchers, really, we would wait till the very, very end and you get those results in 2025 and they would be the final results. That's not helpful for policymakers. They would like some of the answers sooner, but that means that the answers you give sooner may not exactly match the answers that come out in 2025. And that's just a hazard of the a real-time pay-for-success contract that's necessary versus the kind of academic long-term horizon we might like to have for the final answers. And that uh, long-term timeline, I think, is, is an enormous advantage of the study, but also one of the challenges. So I'll end. I, I feel like I was a little bit doom and gloom. Tamar got to tell you about the wonderful work in saving babies, and I'm like, but what about the sample size? Um, <laughs> but, but really, uh, this is an amazing opportunity. I'm Part of what drew me to this project was the innovation in delivery of a wider range, population-based, community-based set of services that has the potential to dramatically change the trajectory of health outcomes and break the intergenerational cycle of poverty. So being able to partner this way to really assess how expanding the program in a new population with a new mechanism, this is a rare opportunity and I think it's really exciting. And it's a test case, I hope, for future partnerships where researchers can participate with implementers in designing a rollout in such a way that you can actually learn how well something works and in what population it works, not just to know the answer to that, but then to redirect funds towards the things that are really working. So this is a great opportunity and I can't wait till 2025 to figure out what happened. <laughs>